Um, hello, Tennessee Voices viewers and listeners. This is David Plazas, the Opinion and Engagement Director for the USA Today Network Tennessee and the Tennessean. Today, I'm delighted to have as my guest, Patricia P. Asp, who's the principal and founder of Aspire. Essentially, her company is about preserving the goodness of companies and organizations, as well as using your experience for the purpose of culture sustainability. So we'll be talking about that during this conversation. Pat, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, David. Thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's my pleasure. And one of the things I wanted to start out with, uh, and I'll be including this in, in the notes to the video podcast, you wrote a, an op-ed in 2020. This was uh, in October, just a few months after the pandemic had started, which is, what are the four essential words of crisis leadership? And I'm not going to test you on the op-ed because it's been a while, but I do want to talk about this notion of crisis leadership. You know, that was back relatively early in the pandemic. And here we are, we're recording on March 1st, 2022. If you could talk a little bit about those, your thoughts about that term crisis leadership and where we are today and what we have to do. Well, I think, you know, primarily around, um, you know, in crisis leadership and leadership as, uh, as a whole, um, we really need to take what's coming at us at the moment uh, there's the vital and the urgent uh, that we are faced with as leaders and to really be able to discern um, the events of the time and how it impacts our business uh, and not just the p and uh, but all the stakeholders, our employees, our investors and owners and our customers in really being able to, um, to really practice empathy for all parties. I think that's great. I hear a lot about empathy um, and that's become extremely much more common in our work culture today. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the evolution of empathy in your own career journey and why it's so important? Well, it's interesting, David. You know, I started out, um, in healthcare, uh, way way back when, and uh, as we were going through, and I was leading in a hospital, um, the support service area, um, we did a um, patient satisfaction survey, and I'll never forget them saying we had done some major restructuring of the departments and putting the are people closer to the patient in being able to respond to the needs of the patient. And it really changed our results where usually support service departments were at the bottom <laughs> of the survey. All of a sudden we moved to the top and I got a call from the uh, designers of the survey. And, um, they share with me, and this was decades ago, decades ago, that the essence of patient satisfaction really dealt with empathy for the patient and the family. And that it wasn't really technical know-how and support but it was really meeting the patient where they were at. And that lesson of practicing true empathy and hardwiring it into your processes and your systems stuck with me for all those decades. Well, that, that's, that's fascinating because this whole conversation, my own experiences in business school, focusing on patient-centered or customer-centered has really not always been there when it's come to, to the, the business world, because a lot of it was product centered uh, and not necessarily about that satisfaction that you get, you know, that, uh, that notion. Could you talk a little bit about, about that? And, and, and what, uh, what about yourself did you bring to the table that helped you help others gain that insight? Well, you know, when you bring yourself and the humanness into leadership, or management or supervision and ask yourself the question, very simple, how would I want to be treated? Even in really tough situations, how would I want to be treated? In business, 
you're hiring people, you're firing people, you're disciplining, you're promoting. And it's really taking that essence of first, how do I want to be treated? But secondly, getting to know the person well enough to determine how they want to be treated. You know, all people are different. And so we can't assume that a label or a group or an area that they all want to be treated the same way. You need to get to know people. And you really need to understand where they were coming from. What, what makes them happy? What makes them sad? What motivates? And what demotivates? And we're all people. Now, is this something that you had to learn or was this something that you were taught and you brought into the business? Well, I think, you know, I think it started with my parents. You know, I mean, uh, I was raised on a dairy farm in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, my dad was an equal opportunity kind of guy before it was the law. <laughs> so I have an older sister and brother. But the interesting thing was um, everybody was welcome in our home, everyone. And, you know, way back when, when there were hobos that would ride trains and they would maybe jump off on your land and my dad would bump into in the lower 40. They were invited into our home for a meal. And not only the meal, but my mother used to pack them sandwiches and that alone to take with them on their journey. And it was, it was very interesting to us as kids, right? We thought like, well, maybe they would, you know, my dad would bring them out a sandwich. No, they were invited to the table. They ate with us. And so that lesson through life of all are welcome. You don't judge a book by its cover, right? Uh, you don't treat people any differently. Uh, you know, on the farm, you, we would have like visiting people from other countries. My uncle was an extension agent. And so he would bring these people in and they were dignitaries. It didn't make any difference. And then in business, and you know, obviously coming first up through healthcare, where there was great compassion and empathy um, towards our patient, towards our employees. I was in the service industry. The work we did was very mundane. Uh, frequently, our service employees were invisible. People would walk right by, they wouldn't use their name. And so we then, I mean, our awareness of that, and uh, we used to have a We Serve Day where we would put on the uniform of a service employee in the different service areas so that we could gain empathy, truly understand what it was like to be invisible mm -hmm. and do work that people really never noticed that it got done unless it wasn't done. Now we talked about just as we were, uh, before we started recording that uh, March is International Women's Month. I wanted to ask you yourself, was it uh, difficult to break into the, the C-level suite and into uh, executive and, and how did you manage with people who might not have been so welcoming because of your gender? Uh, well, it's really interesting, uh, David. Obviously, uh, there weren't any women uh, at the executive level in Fortune 500 company that I grew up in. I was there 25 years. And so I am a product of being male mentored, male sponsored. And yeah, there were uh, times when it was like walking down a black hallway and turning the lights on as we went along. But I, I think at the end of the day, when people's hearts are right, uh, do people make mistakes? Yes. And was it unusual to have a woman 
at the executive level, yes. But I believe through a spirit of uh, authenticity, a spirit of for the common good. And at the end of the day, it was about results. And I often tell people I could have been pink with purple polka dots. But when I was achieving results consistent with our values and mission and vision, it really didn't make any difference. Well, right now we've come to the point of the conversation where I'd like to ask guests what they've been doing for their own self-care. So often leaders put so much, have so much on their shoulders, they don't often take care of themselves the way they should. So what are you watching, reading, doing just to take care of yourself and your wellness? Well, several fold. One is, um, you know, I am a, a woman of faith. And so having that luxury of those hours that I used to spend driving and on the road to spend time in, in devotion and in prayer, but also uh, moving my exercise regime from the health club, which got closed at the beginning of COVID, uh, onto the streets of walking and exercising outdoors and really appreciating nature. Uh, and the beauty of nature and the wonder of nature. Uh, and I continue to uh, do that where we had some extra hours that used to be spent traveling and commuting that could then be spent for both my physical health, but also my spiritual health as well. Thank you so much for that. Um... As I was reviewing some of the uh, guest columns that you've written over time, there's some common themes. We talked about crisis leadership for the first one. You've also written a op-ed called Business Owners Must Have Perseverance to Survive the Pandemic, and businesses are having to do a lot of pivoting in this COVID-19 economy. Since you are a specialist in culture and sustaining that, could you talk a little bit about how businesses can do that effectively and what, they, what pitfalls they should look out for? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's times of vulnerability in a business. It could be during rapid growth. It could be succession or uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, change in ownership. And frequently as business leaders, we look at key indicators. It could be retention, uh, litigation costs, worker compensation claims, um, the time it takes to fill a position or when we're seeing uh, a great departure, uh, what years, what tenures are people leaving? And so when we get those indicators in that, it's time to step back and not address the symptoms, but really look at the overall. And companies as a rule have a mission and a vision and values. What can happen in a very diverse organization, global organizations, even when we say the values, people may have different definitions of the values. Mm -hmm. It's so it's important from an organizational perspective when we put values out that we give the operational definition for our company. What does it mean here? What does integrity mean? What does teamwork mean? Uh, what does mutual respect mean? And so that we are creating alignment. And then we need to go a step further. We need to say, what behaviors do we expect to see evident when the values are being practiced in our company, in our organization? Because behaviors are observable. And so we can measure them. And we can coach to them and mentor. They can be in our position description, in our performance review, in our promotional criteria, in our compensation schemes, so that your hardwiring, your culture for sustainability into your company and organizational model. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think I think this is important, especially at this time when companies are struggling with the retention aspect of it, and also the recruitment aspect. You know, the Great mm -hmm. Resignation is a term that has been used uh, by many analysts, and uh, we're certainly seeing the effect of that in the way that some companies are 
uh, increasing their minimum wage substantially and others are trying to create new internal structures to create a more welcoming environment. Uh, what have you found over time has been, is there any secret sauce that might help companies in this environment? Because it certainly is unusual, at least to our current era. Mm -hmm. Well, it's important to remember that behaviors transcend any labels. And so frequently we get into organizations that are extremely diverse and they're very global. And when you have different takes on the value and the mission of the organization, you don't have alignment. Alignment is important for cohesion, to galvanize teams of people towards common goals and objectives of the organization. And, you know, one of the things we've seen, and we're reading a lot about it now, is the great resignation. And, you know, once again, it's not this big group or pool, we have to know, we have to understand the needs of our people, what motivates them, why do they stay, why would they leave? Because if we don't have that relationship in the organization, from the beginning supervisor, managers, directors, officers, if we don't have those relationships with our people, then how do we know how to lead them so that we're working towards why they stay and then we're not surprised by people wanting to move or to leave? Yeah, it's certainly been something a challenge for so many organizations just to reevaluate their own values and their own uh, role in the community. and. Uh, one of the things that has been interesting too is to see that uh, employees and especially younger employees are expecting their companies to be much more socially active uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and especially when it comes to causes. And, you know, is there um, any danger or benefit opportunity from that kind of relationship? I, I can't really see a downfall to mm -hmm. it. I think what the overarching um, driver is purpose. You know, what is an organization's purpose? What is a company's purpose? And what we're seeing, as you mentioned, David, is our younger um, uh, groups of people coming into our organizations uh, work for a cause, right? They need to know how what they do makes a difference. And we all want to make a difference. I think it was R.C. Sproul that said, deeply ensconced in the marrow of our bones is the need for significance. Mm -hmm. And from that, um, looking at our business, looking at it, not just in terms of what we do, but letting people know why it counts because we all wanna count. Well, Pat, I am so grateful that you have come on the show to talk about your expertise and to talk about many of these important topics that uh, companies and organizations are contending with today. And again, for the Tennessee Voices audience, this is Patricia P. Asp, who is the principal and founder of Aspire, preserving the goodness of companies and organizations. Uh, before I let you go, Pat, I always like to ask my guests if they would leave our audience with some words of wisdom to help them get through this challenging time. How I um, look at my days and that is to focus on others. And I think for all of us, as we uh, navigate the world uh, at large, um, if we keep our focus on others, uh, it matters. But thank you very much. May you stay well and healthy. And I'm so grateful again for you taking the time to be on the show today. Thank you, David.